You see, you and I, I think we like to think of Jesus and religion and spirituality as helping me in my project, right? And so I look to, okay, I need a little bit of Jesus to give me some inspiration. I need a little bit of religion to help me kind of get on the right path as I make decisions in my life. And so we tend to approach life from a self-help perspective. It says, okay, give me some religion on Sunday, give me a positive psychology podcast on Tuesday, give me a nice self-help book on Friday, give me an Oprah talk on Saturday and a TED talk on Saturday night, and that's what I need in order to help me accomplish my goals and become the best version of myself. And so it's Jesus and all of these other things. But what John is saying is if you want to actually understand what Jesus is doing, it requires a complete and total transformation of you, and it is something that you cannot do on your own. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am very well pleased." That's the Lord's word for us today. You may be seated. All right, good morning, church. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Mark is one of the four biographies of the life of Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, if you are using one of our uh, scripture notebooks as we walk through the Gospel of Mark, it's on page 4. So you should be able to find it real nice and quick. We are journeying through the Gospel of Mark over the course of the next year, walking line by line and story by story uh, through this biography of the life of Jesus. Uh, Mark is a, a disciple of Peter, and Peter was a disciple of Jesus, and so he has taken the time and the intent to record for us what actually happened in the life of Jesus. He's very interested in who Jesus was and what Jesus did, and he wrote this so that you and I can understand who Jesus was and what he did for us as well. Uh, and so we're just going to walk, uh, think about it like we're just going to marinate in the Gospel of Mark, right? Like just soak in what Jesus is doing and what it means for you and for me. And so if you're new to the story of Jesus or you're new to following Jesus, uh, this is going to be a really good experience over the, next, over, over the next year as we just dig into who he is. And if you've been following for a while, I hope it, it opens up some rediscovery, uh, some new revelations of who Jesus is. Uh, last week and the week before, we talked about how Mark went about telling this story. He's a masterful storyteller, and most scholars think that what he actually wrote for us here is, is what it sounded like when you heard the gospel of Jesus proclaimed for the very first time. When you were in the public square or when you were out in the community, someone was sharing the good news of Jesus, this is probably what it sounded like. He took the time to actually record what people said when they declared the gospel in the market or in the synagogue or wherever it was that you were hearing the good news of Jesus for the first time. And so he has thought intentionally about how he wants us to experience Jesus, how he wants us to think about Jesus, and how he wants to challenge us with who Jesus actually is. Uh, and there's really two questions that Mark wants you to think about throughout the whole of his story, the whole of his gospel. And these are the two questions that are really going to frame everything that we talk about for the next year. Uh, the first question is, who actually is Jesus? Who actually is Jesus of Nazareth? This character, this person, just think about there. He's sharing this gospel probably less than a generation removed from Jesus. So a lot of people had probably heard of this guy named Jesus of Nazareth. I probably heard that he had done some things, maybe heard a thought that he had risen from the dead. And so he wants you to actually think about who is this character called Jesus? 
But not only that, once I understand who he is, the second question he wants you to think about is what does it mean to actually follow him? What does it mean to be a student of Jesus or a disciple of Jesus or an apprentice of Jesus? All those words are wrapped up in the idea of being a disciple. It's to listen to Jesus and to live life like he lived, Jesus, like, like he lived his life, as if he was your rabbi and your teacher and your king. He wants you to ask that question. And one of the ways that Mark does this through his gospel, as we're going to see over the next year, is he's going to give us some information uh, that other people are going to struggle with. Uh, last week we talked about dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is when you know more that is, that is happening in the story than the characters in the story do. It's where you're watching a scary movie and you know where the monster is and the characters don't and so you feel the fear and the anxiety and your adrenaline starts pumping because you see what they don't. And so he is giving us in chapter 1 especially everything that we need to know and see and understand so that through the rest of the story, when disciples misunderstand Jesus, when religious people misunderstand Jesus, when the Romans misunderstand Jesus, you know what they're missing. And in doing that, he's drawing you into the story to help you see and feel and experience who Jesus is. And so chapter 1 is really the most explicit that we get for who Jesus is. And from here on out, Mark is, say, is saying, I've told you what you need to know. Now ask the question. Now think about it. Now let's figure it out together. And here in chapter 1, we meet the first disciple of Jesus. And it's not Peter. It's not James. It's not John. It's not Thaddeus. I always forget about Thaddeus, one of the disciples. What a name. All right. It's none of those. It's instead this crazy-sounding character who wears camel hair and eats locusts out in the wilderness, a guy by the name of John. John the Baptizer. Uh, That's not his last name, not John Baptist, but John, the one who is baptizing people in the wilderness. If you look in verse 2 and 3, we looked at these verses last week in reference to Jesus, but these verses are also in reference to John and who he is. These are quotations from the Old Testament, promises that God made to his people about when the kingdom of God was going to come, when God was going to restore all things, what should they be looking for? And so there was this promise in the Old Testament that there was going to be a voice crying out in the wilderness, a prophet that was going to announce when this event was going to happen. And so the people of that time were always wondering, who's that voice? Where is that prophet? When is he going to show up? And so Mark quotes these. He says, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. And that's the end of the quotation. And notice the very next thing he says. John came baptizing in the wilderness. He says, this is who you're looking for. You're looking for John who appears in the wilderness, just like that voice was promised to appear in the wilderness. And what is he doing? He is preparing people to hear and respond to the good news of the kingdom of God. Mark is telling you that one that you've been looking for, that one who is going to signal that a new era is coming, he is here, and he's that crazy-sounding guy in camel's hair and eating locusts out in the desert. And notice what's happening. Crowds of people are coming out to him. Now, Mark has told us a few things about John. In particular, if you knew the story of the Old Testament, you would think, oh, that's what's happening. He seems very interested in his camel hair outfit and his diet. I don't know what camel hair feels like, but it does not sound like it feels comfortable. But here's what's happening, right? Look at verse 6 here. It says, John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 1, it may have been a while since you've been in 2 Kings in the Old Testament, there's a wicked king on the throne of Israel. And he is doing all kinds of evil. And there's, there's this voice, there's this character that appears in the wilderness, and he starts declaring all of the terrible, evil things that this king is doing. And as you can imagine, the king doesn't like that. That's bad press. I don't like people calling me out on my sin and my evil. And so he has people go investigate, and they come back, and this is what they say in 2 Kings 1, verse 8. They say this, He was a hairy man and had a leather belt tied around his waist. And the king hears that, and you know what he says? He's Elijah the Tishbite. You see, he knew right away by the appearance of Elijah that that's who he was. That this was one of the most prominent prophets in the Old Testament. 
And so Mark has given you the clues or the hyperlinks to say, okay, remember Elijah the Tishbite, Elijah that one who did, that one who did all those miracles and all those incredible things when there was an evil king on the throne. John is wearing the exact same outfit as he is. He is announcing very similar things that he is, that John is a prophet in the line of prophets like Elijah, who did incredible things. This is who this character is, this prophet that the people have been looking for. And notice what's happening in verse 4. And here's, here's really where John begins to help us think through that question. What does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower or a student of the way of Jesus? It says, John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now, one of the key themes in Mark's gospel that we're going to look at over and over and over again over the next year is Mark always places this contrast between the crowds and the disciple. 37 times in Mark's story, the crowds are referenced looking at Jesus, pursuing Jesus. They want to see Jesus do miracles. They want to listen to his teachings. They want to laugh when he mocks the religious leaders. They want to see the spectacle that is Jesus. But over and over and over again, the crowds are confused about who Jesus is, and there are often disciples who are being called out of the crowds to step out and follow Jesus. And so what do we have here in verse 5 is there's a whole crowd that's coming, and they want to see a religious spectacle. They want to see a little bit of religious entertainment. They want to see what is this voice that's crying out in the wilderness. And John, he stands apart from them, weird in his appearance, weird in his proclamation, even misunderstood some points. And, and, and he represents what it looks like first and foremost to be a disciple. It's to step out of the crowd and to be willing to follow Jesus. And, and remember, if Mark is giving us the, the verbal presentation of the gospel, right? If, if this is what it sounded like when they announced the good news of the gospel in the town square, right? First thing he said was beginning of the good news. And so everyone who's listening to this gospel would, would start to gather around. There'd be a crowd forming. They'd be listening to this gospel as Mark or Peter or whoever began to explain it or tell it or perform it. And right away, what you will encounter as that crowd is forming is a crisis of decision. Right? There's an invitation that you have to answer. Are you going to be willing to step out of the crowd, to step out of the common thought, what everyone else is doing, the peer pressure, the expectations of your family and your culture, and are you going to be willing to step out and say, yes, I'll be a disciple of Jesus? You see, Mark is challenging you that this isn't just a story to listen to. This is a story that demands a certain degree of decision. A certain degree of action, a change or a transformation has to take place as you listen to the story. That's what it means to be a disciple. And notice the message that he is proclaiming in verse 4. He says he's proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, in the original language, these are a couple of really significant words all kind of smushed together. Mark is trying to capture everything that, that John was announcing in just a few words. So I just want to break down each one of those words to understand what was John actually doing and what did it actually mean for the people who were hearing it. First, he declares a baptism. Now, in the Old Testament law and in, in, in uh, like Exodus and Leviticus and those kind of things that the Jewish people would have followed, there were lots of ceremonial washings. Uh, you would wash your hands before you sat down for a meal. You would wash parts of your body if you had experienced some sort of uncleanliness or had been exposed to some sort of sin. It was a symbol of, I've been in contact with sin or I have participated in sin, and so I need to symbolically wash that away. It was a picture of the corrupting nature of sin, that when I choose my own way, when I choose selfishness or, or, or brokenness or the things that God says not to, it actually stains me, if you will. And so there are all sorts of ritual washings that they had to do whenever they approached the temple or whenever they sat down for a meal. But the more sinful you were, or the more significant the sin was that you had done, the more of you you needed to wash, right? And so what maybe seemed like a minor sin was like a hand washing, but what was maybe more of a significant sin required a little bit of a bigger hand washing or a bigger kind of scrub down to really represent the weight of that sin. All the way to there's some evidence that if you are a Gentile, meaning that you weren't part of the people of Israel, and you wanted to follow the God of Israel, you had to wash yourself completely. You had to 
go head to toe to represent that there's a whole new way that I am entering into. You see, Mark, what does he invite people into? What is he calling people into? The language of baptism is the language of submersion or immersion, or if you want to go easier, dunking, all the way under the water. And so if they were used to thinking, okay, however much water I need to wash, that's how sinful I was, that's how, uh, how significant my sin was. When, when John calls them to be baptized, he's saying, you need a total washing. That the corruption of sin is complete. It's not just what your hands have done, it's every aspect of you needs a washing. And not just the Gentiles, right? Not just the ones who are outside the people of God, but even the Jews who had been following the way of God, had been listening to the Torah and the Old Testament law, all of them needed to experience this full submersion, this full washing from head to toe. Because sin is a totally corrupting kind of thing. Now, not only that, all of the washings in the Old Testament were something that you did. So it's like, okay, I sin, so I need to go wash my hands. I need to go wash my feet or wash my head or my hair or whatever. I need to go do this. But the baptism that John is offering to people is not something that they do. It's rather something that they come and someone does it to them. You see, this is a totally innovative way of doing baptism. There's no evidence that anyone had ever done this before. John, and he begins this, he initiates this, he innovates this. And here's what he's saying. Sin is completely corrupting. And it requires something from outside of you in order to be rescued and redeemed from it. It's not something that you can kind of manage or wash away on your own. It is completely corrupting from head to toe, inside and out. And the only way to be rescued from it, the only way to be redeemed from it, the only way to experience forgiveness from it is if someone outside of you comes and does something to you. This is when he says a baptism of repentance, the word that he uses is metanoia. This is where we get our word metamorphosis from. He's saying that what you need is a complete and total transformation. A complete and total renovation of who you are from the inside out. Now think about what happens when an insect goes through metamorphosis. Right, you get a little, like, kind of little larvae that's kind of cute, maybe a little creepy, right? and then it wraps itself in this chrysalis, and what happens inside of that is it actually melts away. It actually, all the essence of it just kind of uh, melts into a tiny pool, and inside that little chrysalis, what's happening, it is being transformed. It is being metamorphosized, and so what comes out of it is the same creature, but a totally different form or transformed experience of that creature. That's what metamorphosis, that's what metanoia means. And so when he says a baptism of repentance, he's saying you need a complete and total transformation of every aspect of your being. And this is how you prepare for what this one, this Messiah is going to do. You see, you and I, I think we like to think of Jesus and religion and spirituality as helping me in my project. Right? And so I look to, okay, I need a little bit of Jesus to give me some inspiration. I need a little bit of religion to help me kind of get on the right path as I make decisions in my life. And so we tend to approach life from a self-help perspective. It says, okay, give me some religion on Sunday, give me a positive psychology podcast on Tuesday, give me a nice self-help book on Friday, give me an Oprah talk on Saturday and a TED talk on Saturday night. And that's what I need in order to help me accomplish my goals and become the best version of myself. And so it's Jesus and all of these other things. But what John is saying is if you want to actually understand what Jesus is doing, it requires a complete and total transformation of you, and it is something that you cannot do on your own. It is something that you need from outside of yourself, something that you need from God and what he is about to do. You see, the reason why I think this is so hard for us is because what we really fear and what we really resist is being transformed by someone or something outside of ourselves, right? It's like, as long as I'm in control, as long as I'm trying to help me, then I can choose, okay, I'm going to listen to this podcast and read that book and get a little bit of help here, but I'm still in the driver's seat. I'm still in control. It's still me calling the shots, and so as long as God helps me accomplish my plans, then I'm good. But John's baptism shows us that we need a complete and total transformation, if we're actually going to be in alignment with God and what he wants to do in our world, 
And that is not something that can come from inside you and me. It's only something that can come from outside. And notice the very next thing that he says. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. You see, Mark's answer to this transformation that John the Baptist is calling us to is Jesus. He says, if this is something that I cannot bring on my own, then where can I find this transformation? Even John says, this baptism itself is not the transformation that you need. Where does that transformation come from? It comes only from Jesus. Now, notice the contrast between verse 5 and verse 9. Mark's very intentional about how he's wording this. In verse 5, we have the whole Judean countryside and all the people going out to John. Where does Jesus come from? And Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he goes out to the Jordan with John. But notice the difference. In verse 5, they're being baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. They're confessing their sins. But notice what Jesus does not do. He does not confess his sins. He is not baptized for the repentance of his sins. You see, there's something about Jesus that makes his baptism different. He doesn't come in and say, okay, here's all the things that I've done wrong. He comes in and he's baptized, not from a position of I need transformation or I need forgiveness or I need something from outside of myself. No, he comes in and he's baptized. And what happens is in the moment that he's baptized, the heavens are torn open and God reveals himself completely. See, Mark wants you to see that Jesus is different. And Jesus is the transformation that we need. Now, there's all kinds of things that Mark is telling us in these few verses. I just want to point out a couple things. First is this. Jesus shows us who God really is. Who is this God who is going to transform me? Who is this God who is coming to me in Jesus? This is one of the few passages in all of the scriptures where we see the full identity and experience of who God is. You'll notice in verse 10, it says, As soon as he came up out of the water, he saw the heavens being torn open. This is apocalyptic kind of language, right? This is like something is happening. It's like how you felt on Monday when you watched the eclipse, right? Like you could not not look at it. Hopefully you had your glasses on, but you could not not look at it, right? Because all of a sudden, everything changed, and it was so completely disorienting. So I've never seen anything like that before. That's what's happening here. The heavens are being torn open, and the Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And a voice from heaven says, you are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is one of the few times in Scripture that we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all interacting in one scene. You see, there's some uh, versions of God that you hear out there that God is like a transformer. And so sometimes he's God the Father, sometimes he's God the Son, sometimes he's God the Spirit, and it kind of depends on his mood or the needs, and so he just kind of switches from one mode to another. But notice here in this text, that's not possible. That can't possibly be the God of the Bible, because God is in Jesus in the Jordan River, God is in the Spirit descending from heaven, and God is in the voice that is announcing from heaven, this is my beloved Son. You see, this shows us what Christians have claimed since the very beginning, is that God is one God and yet in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see that Jesus in the water, God the Son, receiving the blessing of God the Father. We see that in God the Father sending the Spirit down to rest upon Jesus. We see that in Jesus' obedience to God the Father here in this scene. And, And this kind of clarity about who God is is why Jesus is so important. Because Jesus shows us, he reveals to us who God is and how it is that we can actually know him. This is what Christians have called the Trinity or the the triunity of the Godhead. And and it sounds really complex, and if you lean into it, it gives you a little bit of a headache. But if if we're talking about the God of the universe, it probably should be a little bit beyond our reasoning, right? I mean, if it could just perfectly fit in my reasoning, then I'm probably not God. But here's why this, this is really, really important. Right? Because if God is just one, right? let's just say there's just God in the sense that there's only one person within God, then that God could never really truly know love. Because anything that that God would create, let's say he created you and me, we'd always be less than that God. We'd always be subservient to that God. Right? And so maybe that God could learn to love us and learn to love creation, but it'd always be kind of like how you love your pet. 
right? Where it's like, yeah, I love you, but also you kind of annoy me. And there's not really mutuality. I feed you, and you, and you, you do all kinds of stuff in the backyard, and, and I tolerate you. If God was just one God, that would always be the relationship that we'd have with him. On the other hand, if God was just three, right? If God was three or more, right? Which is what a lot of religions in their day taught. Think the Greek pantheon. There are lots of different gods. Then that God would always be at conflict. There would always be some sort of disagreement or discord. This is how most of the ancient world thought the world came to be, was gods who were warring. And so one God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create humans, and humans are going to fight my battles for me. Or you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to to create storm clouds, and those storm clouds are going to fight my battles for me. Most of the ancient world thought that there were many gods, and these gods were constantly in conflict, constantly in warfare. And so what do we see in the God that Jesus reveals to us? We see a God who is one, meaning this God has control and power and authority and autonomy, And yet also a God who has always and forever existed as a community of love. This God has always known love. This God has never not known love because this God has always been Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we see that here in just these few verses is that this God is giving. He is giving a blessing to his Son. He is giving the Spirit to Jesus. Jesus is giving his obedience and his honor to God the Father. This God is at his essence, at his core, a community of love. This is what Christians mean when they say God is love. It doesn't just mean that God feels nice thoughts about us, but that God has always in his essence and his core been love. C.S. Lewis put it this way in Mere Christianity. What Christians mean by the statement God is love is that the living, dynamic activity of love has been going on in God forever and has created everything else. In Christianity, God is not a static thing, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama or a kind of dance. You see, this sets the way of Jesus apart from every other religion and spirituality you'll find out there. You'll find lots of religions and spirituality where there is one God, You'll find lots of religious and spiritual perspectives where there's many gods or many powers or many authorities, but only in the way of Jesus do we find a God who has always been love, and yet a God who has also always been one. And this makes so many things make sense in our world. Makes so many. Th- Why is it that we love relationships? Why is it that we long for connection? Why is it that we look out in the universe or look at the eclipse and say there must be something bigger out there? Because God created us to know him. He didn't create us so that we would serve him as subservient slaves. He created out of love and out of a desire to share that love with us. This makes science possible if you think about it. Like if there's one God, then that means the world is predictable. That means that the creation I created is not just a whole bunch of gods fighting. It means that he created a universe of order that we can study and we can know. And the more that we look into it, the more that we will discover this God who is. This makes so many things that we long for make sense. But not only is that how God is revealed in Jesus, but also it helps us understand what God is doing in this moment. In this moment in Jesus' life. In this moment in Jesus' life ministry. In in, uh, the Aramaic translation of Genesis 1, uh, Aramaic was like the common language that people spoke. It's like most of us speak English, kind of just comes out of us normally. Aramaic was what they spoke uh, in kind of everyday language. And there's a translation that was commonly read of Genesis 1 in Aramaic that actually sounds like this. Genesis 1 verse 2, and the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep, And the Spirit of God fluttered above the face of the waters like a dove. And God spoke, let there be light. See, what Mark is wanting you to see is that what is happening here is not just that the God of the universe, the God who is love, the God who created everything, not just that he exists, but in Jesus he is recreating everything. He is bringing us the transformation that you and I need The renovation of every aspect of our being is happening in Jesus. That God is initiating his recreation mission in and through the person of Jesus. And so just like he created everything in Genesis 1 and everything came to be here in Mark's gospel and what Jesus is doing is he is beginning a recreation work where that transformation that you and I need is coming in and through the person of Jesus. 
That if God created everything with the voice of his, uh, of his declaration and the presence of his spirit, now in the presence of Jesus, his word made flesh, the spirit is moving, God is recreating us. And it is only when we know and follow him that we will be recreated ourselves. One author put it this way, as in the book of Genesis, God created by his word and through the spirit. So it was fitting that at the very commencement of God's new work of recreation, there would be the same operation of the whole Godhead. Here on Jordan's banks, God speaks his word again, and again the Spirit is brooding over the waters as in Genesis. See, where do we go for that transformation? Where do we go for that recreation? Mark is saying the only place that you can go is the God who created everything. And where is that God moving? Where is that God active? Where is that God working in Jesus as he comes up out of the waters? And as Jesus, as he walks the land that we're about to see, Jesus, as he dies on the cross for our sins, Jesus, as he's risen again, this is the only place that you can find this transformation. And so only when you follow him will you have this new way. This is why John says even here, I baptize you with water. He's saying, look, this is just water. You got it out of the tap. It's flowing down the Jordan. It's just water. What you actually need is the Holy Spirit. What you actually need is the presence of God. What you actually need is God himself indwelling you and transforming you from the inside out. And who is it that he says will bring that? Only Jesus. And so when you know him, when you follow him, that is how you begin to be made who God wants you to be. Now what's the first step in entering into this journey? How do you actually get that? That sounds great. You might say, okay, yeah, I, need, I know I need transformation. I know my life's not perfect. I know I got issues. I know I got stuff. I'm listening to a religious podcast. I'm in church. What do I need to do? The first thing, the first step in entering the journey of discipleship is humility. All right, we see that in John here. We see that, right? Look at his humility. He says, one who is more powerful than I am is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the strap of his sandals. John, who is the prophet that was foretold. John, who has crowds clamoring to be baptized by him. John is saying, this is who I am. I'm not worthy to even untie the shoelaces of the one who is to come, this Jesus, who is God recreating all things. You see, it takes humility to admit that you need transformation. And you can't do that on your own. The reason why we love doing things on our own is because we still can be in control. I can still have some pride, say, look what I accomplished, look what I did. But John's baptism says the only way that you can really be made new is if you admit your sin and say, I need help from outside myself. That's how you begin the journey of discipleship. That's why Mark begins us here is because the first step is admitting, I can't do it on my own. I need God to do something in my life. I need Jesus to do something in my life. I need to be set free from my sins. That's the first step in the journey of discipleship, is saying, I've been following my own way. I need to follow Jesus' way. I've been following my own way into sin and selfishness and greed and lust and all the things that disintegrate me and destroy me. And so humility is saying, I'm going to turn from that, and I need to follow Jesus instead as he leads me out of the land of death, out of the land of sin, out of the land of brokenness, and into the land of life and joy and flourishing and the presence of the Holy Spirit who wants to make me new. That's the beginning of the journey of discipleship. It's to humbly admit, yeah, I've got sin. My only hope is not managing my sin. It's a complete and total transformation as I follow Jesus. But that's also how we mature on the journey of Jesus. And it's not like we begin the journey with humility and then we begin to get our stuff together and we say, you know what, I'm doing pretty well. No, John is on the journey of discipleship and what does he say? I'm not worthy to follow Jesus. And this is not like a beating myself up, I'm looking at myself in the mirror, pointing out all my flaws kind of humility. This is, I recognize the goodness of Jesus. I recognize his love and his compassion and his presence. And so in light of that, I understand myself correctly, that I am simply a servant in Jesus' household. The one who would untie the straps of the shoes in the household was the lowest servant on the totem pole. He had the most menial job, and John says, that's my role. 
You see, the way of following Jesus, the way of growing in the way of Jesus, is not a movement up and to the right. More power, more prominence, more prestige, more thinking highly of myself. It is down. To say, the more I follow Jesus, the more I see him, the more I understand him, the more humble I become. That's why John, at the end of his ministry, all of his disciples left him. Right, which is kind of like he has this whole movement right now. At the end of his ministry, all of his disciples leave him. And you know what he says? He must increase. I must decrease. That must be our attitude if we're going to be truly disciples of the way of Jesus. He must increase. God, do the work even if it crushes me. God, do the work even if it rings out all the pride in my heart. God, do the work even if it means that no one sees what I'm doing. Because you must increase, Jesus. And so give me a bigger vision of you, Jesus. Help me see who you actually are. Help me feel the reality of your goodness and your love and your grace so that I can have a proper view of myself. And I can serve you as you called me to. That is what we were made for. And that is what following Jesus looks like. And so whether you're new to the journey or you've been on this journey for years, right, Mark is saying the key to this is humility. Looking to Jesus the only hope for transformation and recreation. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that even as we pray to you, we don't have to convince you to listen to us. We don't have to try to get your attention, God, because you are love and you created us for love, to know your love. So God, in our sin and our selfishness and our brokenness, we do things our own way. But God, you are loving and good and just enough to reach out to us, to continue to pursue us. God, I pray that you'd help us to see this morning our need for transformation. Not just some self-help, we need a complete and total transformation. Would you grow our awareness of who you are so that we would have a proper humility that comes from knowing you. God, for the one who's here and they're beginning to explore Jesus, they're beginning the journey of following him. Would you show them their sins so they can lean on him more? God, may our heartbeat and our attitude be, he must increase, I must decrease, so that Jesus, you can get all the glory as we follow you. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.